Well, I hope you all had a good Christmas. Our Christmas was pretty quiet. It was just Burnett and I, which I uh, don't know when the last time was it was like that. Uh, but then Friday came. And when Friday came, the herd came rolling in. And so the entire row here is kind of the Richards clan plus some little grandsons that are running around someplace. And so our house now looks more like a refugee camp. And, uh, but it's, it's a happy refugee camp. Um, Burnett and I were just thinking back to, you know, at the time before we had kids when life was quieter. And uh, our first home uh, here in Squim, we got married and there was an older couple that owned this piece of property. They had their home on it and they had a single wide mobile home. And they invited us to be their renters. And it was a great place to get started. I mean, this was uh, beautifully landscaped, it had an orchard, it had gardens, it had two landscaped trout ponds that were stocked. And part of the deal of living there was you got to fish out of the trout ponds wherever you wanted to. Um, it was just a really nice spot to start. And part of the deal for getting to live there was that you would take care of the place when they were traveling. And uh, I think I've shared this story before, but it obviously has left a mark on my life. And so I thought I'd share it again. Um, that summer, when the landlord left, they're going to be gone for about three months. He gave me some instructions. And one of the things he told me was that he was not going to plant a garden since they were going to be gone all summer. He said, if you'd like to garden, uh, feel free to use the garden area for whatever you'd like to plant. Uh, the other thing was I was in charge of taking care of the trout ponds, just, you know, feeding the trout every day. And, and he said, if you see any algae breaking out in a pond, uh, you can just net it out and then, as I understood the instructions, spray it down and kind of dissipate what's left and that'll take care of the problem. Not a problem. So they leave, and uh, I'm thinking, what do I want to garden this summer? I'm, I'm not really a big gardener. My parents were, my wife's parents, they were big gardeners, but we're not really big gardener people. But I thought, you know, the one thing that there's never enough of at the end of the summer is yellow crookneck squash. I happen to love yellow crookneck squash. And people always give you zucchinis by the truckload, but that's not what I wanted. I wanted yellow crookneck squash. So I thought, I'm going to plant some squash. Now, I wasn't really sure how much squash to expect from a given squash hill. So I figured since I had the whole garden to myself, I would just plant plenty. And I planted 10 hills. Some of you understand what I've done. <laughs> 10 hills of yellow crookneck squash. That was my garden. Um, all went well, but I did run into some surprises. The first was uh, the impact that I had on the trout. Uh, things were going along swimmingly for a few weeks until one day I came out and noticed that in one of the ponds there was uh, definitely a blob of pond scum there, algae growing in the pond. But I remember what I'd been told, so I got the net, I netted that stuff out, and I sprayed it down good to make sure I made it all go away and uh, came back out the next day to check and there was actually a bigger chunk of algae in the pond thought, I must not have sprayed it down well enough. So I did it again. This time, I really sprayed it down good. I came back the next day, and there was more. Well, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. So this time, I rigged up a sprayer on a ladder and set it so it would run for like an hour into the pond. I mean, I just really hosed it down. Let me just say that the effect of that was sort of like pushing the plunger on dynamite. I came back out and the pond had just exploded with algae. There is algae everywhere. And it just got worse and worse and worse. It got so bad that fish were literally dying in the algae, being strangled because they couldn't swim anymore. There was so much green gunk in this pond. I ended up wading into the pond up to my waist in green goo, trying to, with my hands, feel around to find the survivors, fish them out, and throw them in the other pond just to, you know, save the ones I could. Completely destroyed that pond. Had to drain the whole thing and start over from scratch. So that was what I had to do with the trout. Um, the spotted owl had a little impact on us because I was working in a lumber mill at the time, and uh, they decided that spotted owls wouldn't sit in young trees. And so because they're protecting all the old growth, that had some ramifications on the timber industry. And the result was that I got laid off, along with a lot of other people. And so now I don't have a job. And uh, I've been applying to seminary, applying to graduate school. I've been thinking about, praying about when would be the time to go. And we decided, well, unemployed seems like a pretty good time to make a move. So we made our move, went to graduate school. 
which happened before harvest time for the Yellow Crook Neck Squash. The landlord came home to one, a dry, dead, crusty pond, and two, 10 very prosperous hills, or 10 very prosperous hills of crookneck squash. He called me and he said, Tim, what have you done to me? Um, <laughs> he had a lot of yellow crookneck squash. Sadly, once again, I didn't get any. But uh, in the process, I learned an important lesson about the way life works. And that is that both wise and unwise investments bring returns. And sometimes a lot more return than you planned on. We're going to take a look this morning at Galatians chapter 6, and uh, we're going to finish up our study through Galatians by looking at verses 6 through 11. And if you're looking in your Bibles, you're going to say, but Tim, Galatians 6 has 18 verses. What happened to 12 to 18? And the answer is, we covered those at the very beginning of the series, and if you missed it, I'm sorry. So, we're going to finish up at Galatians 6, 6 through 11. Let me just read 6 through 10 to kind of orient us to the context. It says, Let the one who is taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked, for whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Verse 7 is one that I learned as a kid, but I learned it in the old King James. You know how it goes. Be not deceived. God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And uh, that's one of those verses a little kid you, you can lock onto. You get it. You know, you, you will reap what you sow. And if you make a good choice, good things will come. You make a bad choice, bad things will come. But I never really understood that verse in its context. I didn't see that it flowed right out of Galatians 6.6. 6. Here's what Galatians 6.6 6 says. Let the one who has taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. So interestingly, Paul sees a connection between spiritual consequences and financial support for Christian ministers. That, that's actually the context this flows in. Share uh, good things with those who teach, and then uh, God is not mocked. You will sow what you reap. Uh, somebody noted that the last time we talked about the topic of finances, I conveniently arranged to be out of the country and had someone else talk about it, which I thought was masterful planning on my part. Unfortunately, I have not planned so well this time around, so I have to talk about it. Um, let me just make three observations about this idea of sharing all good things with the one who teaches. The first is that Paul's letters were always tailored to the particular needs of the churches to whom he was writing. And so, apparently in the province of Galatia, this was a problem. There were apparently faithful teachers who were struggling to both teach well, carry out that office as a teacher, a leader in the church, and to also pay their bills. And so in that context, to those people whose leaders were struggling, Paul says, you should be sharing with these teachers. You should be taking care of them. Uh, good teaching takes time. It, it is a job in and of itself. Uh, the old reformer Martin Luther said this, he said, it's impossible for one man both to labor day and night to get a living and at the same time to give himself to the study of sacred learnings as the preaching office requireth. I love the THs. Well, Paul himself was certainly willing to be bivocational. Uh, while Paul received support from people and it, oftentimes they helped him to carry out his ministry, we also know from Paul's life story that uh, he 
he worked, too, at a, just a regular job. He was a tent maker. And in times, he did that really to set an example for others. Here's what he says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. He says, We were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. So he's saying, I wasn't a freeloader. But with toil and labor, we worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. It was not because we do not have that right, but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. So Paul was setting out to this whole congregation that, that they should be people that take responsibility, that provide for themselves, that know how to work hard. But Paul says, hey, listen, there, there, is, a, there is a right, there's a place for those in ministry to be supported. And, and Paul himself wasn't always making tents and trying to preach and teach simultaneously. Uh, quite possibly the false teachers that had come into Galatia in gathering their adherents had also been having a negative impact on the support that was being given to faithful teachers. Whatever the situation is, Paul felt compelled to exhort them to invest in their ministers. The second point I would make is that the Galatian situation is not our situation. Uh, this topic really isn't all that difficult for me to talk about because this church, you all take very good care of your leaders. Uh, our needs are provided for, and there is a lot of generosity in this church body, not just in caring for staff, but just the overall needs of this ministry. I am just so grateful for what a generous body this is. That is not true everywhere. As you know, I was in the Philippines this fall, and speaking at a pastor's conference there, about 250 Filipino pastors, and many of these pastors are struggling to make ends meet. They are truly living a subsistence kind of life. And coming to this conference, one of the highlights for them, I think I've shared this before, was they all got a medical checkup when they showed up. For some of them, that was the only medical care they got for the year. Uh, they received five books, and they were so happy because they just don't have any resources. Uh, they got a big bag of rice when they left. Uh, some folks told me that for some of these guys, that was really the highlight of the conference because they struggled to provide for their families. And so in a context like that, um, encouraging those who are part of a church family to take care of those who lead them and to help them and support them uh, is, is such a needed thing. The third point I would bring up in reference to this is that um, I have zero agenda to increase the budget out of any sense of shortfall. Uh, Corey Meyer told me after the first service, he was kind of worried when he heard me start talking like this, like I was going to tell you all we don't need any money anymore. Um, th that's not true. It, it costs money to keep the lights on, keep us all working. But but in talking about this, it's not because we are coming up short. Uh, in fact, if you look at our budget for the year to date, we actually have received a little bit more than we spent, which is good. We work hard to be physically responsible with your giving. But that's not to say that giving doesn't have, and increased giving doesn't have some real benefits. One of those, for sure, is that giving has a direct connection to expanded ministry. When I say that our expenditures did not exceed our income, that is very true. But if you look at the budget we had initially proposed at the start of the year, th that was a larger sum than actually came in. And that's because there were ideas that people had for ministry, things they wanted to do that we said, if God provides the money, here are things we'd like to do. And as the year went along, you know, we, we adjust accordingly. But increased giving always means that there is increased opportunity for ministry. So that is a benefit to the church body as a whole, that we can do more together as we give more together. The other benefit I would mention in giving is that giving, I believe, has a direct connection to my own personal growth. 
And, and right now, I, I get paid by a church, but we also give. But most of my career, I have spent uh, working a job, running a business, to, like, like a lot of you. And, and so giving was one of those disciplines for me and just my participation in the church. And there are, there are ways that I think that this causes us to, to grow as individuals. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, you've probably heard the joke about the $100 bill and the $1 bill that met up in a wallet one day. And the, uh, the $1 bill was kind of impressed. I mean, there was a 100 with, you know, those extra zeros in there. And, and so a little enviously, he says, man, it, it must be great to be you. And the $100 bill says, well, I admit, it, it is a pretty exciting whirlwind, but frankly, I'm kind of exhausted. He says, I've been going to restaurants probably two, three times a week. He said, the shows I've been to, I can't think how many shows I've gone to. He said, a bunch of us got together a while back and got a boat. We had a lot of fun with the boat. Um, and it seems like every month I keep making my rounds through MasterCard and Visa. You know, it's just, I'm just exhausted. And he looks at the $1 bill and he says, you know, that, that's really enough about me. How about you? What have you been up to? The $1 bill kind of hung his head and he says, well, you know, same old thing, just church, church, church. Galatians 6, 7. The one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Do you know what money really is? Money is just a conversion of your life energy into an easily exchanged medium. That's what it is. You've only been given so many heartbeats on this earth, and some of those heartbeats you have used up doing work. And in recognition of the work that you've expended, the heartbeats that you've given up, someone has, has given you a piece of paper. And they said, this is what I think your heartbeats are worth. And, and you then take that representation of your life, and you decide how you want to invest it. That's what you do with money. You decide how you want to invest your life. Where I put my money is an expression of what I believe is worth investing my life energy into. I showed you a chart a couple weeks ago. Talked about the fact we all have this underlying need to have security, to be loved, to have significance, to feel like we have importance, and, and that all of us naturally create some goals, some beliefs about what is going to get that for me. What is going to make me feel loved? What's going to make me feel important? What's going to make me happy? And I set those goals and I start living life to achieve those goals. And those goals tend to be all about me. But we talked about the fact that when we come to Jesus, when his spirit comes to reside in us, the Holy Spirit also cares about security and significance, but he's got a different set of goals. He says the way to have those goals met aren't necessarily the goals that I've set for myself. There are some Jesus goals that will actually do a better job of meeting those deepest hungers of my heart. The problem is, so often, the Jesus goals and the me goals are in opposition to each other. And Paul talks about that spiritual struggle we go through sometimes as to which goals am I living for. Sometimes we say that we're investing in one set of goals, but if you actually examined our actions, our time, our checkbook, for those of you who don't know what checkbooks are anymore, they're a thing we wrote down how much money we had and where we spent it. Um, but our finances say something too about which goals are we living for? Where are we investing our life energy? N.T. Wright says this, The Christian view of money is that it is a responsibility given by God. It is never purely for one's own enjoyment. It is held in trust. If used wisely, sown in the picture Paul is using, it will produce a harvest of good things. One word of caution. It is possible to give to God's work with me motives. Uh, I can try to give to God to get more for me. 
When I was a kid, my, my dad, unfortunately, liked to listen to a whole slate of TV preachers that seemed to spend most of their time trying to convince people to send money to them. And one of the arguments for why you should send money to them was that you were planting faith seeds. And that if you would plant the seeds, i.e., send money to them, that you would then reap a harvest, i.e., more money for you. So the reason to invest in the things of the Lord is so that you can get more money to spend on you. I would say that that is absolutely the wrong reason to invest your money in God's work. Another reason that people sometimes want to give, even to good things, is because they want to be seen. They want to gain influence. They want the reputation for their generosity. It's really feeding their own ego. Jesus talked about this in Matthew chapter 6. He said, When you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. So in their day, apparently there were people that literally had someone blow a trumpet as they brought their alms to give to the poor to be sure that everybody knew just how generous they were. And so again, it looks like I'm giving to a Jesus goal, but in fact, I'm feeding a me goal, which is to have you all notice me. Just so you know, none of us as pastors know who gives what. So if you've been giving to gain influence, I hate to break it to you, but it's had absolutely no effect. Galatians 5, 6, I love what it said. We looked at this a couple weeks ago. Paul said the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. That's the reason that we give anywhere. It should be our faith, our love for Christ, expressing itself in how we use our time, in how we use our treasure, and how we use our talents to give to the things that we believe matter most to God's heart. I think the bigger principle at play here isn't just make sure the preacher isn't living out of his car. The bigger principle is one of generosity to all. And, and we know that because you take a look at Galatians 6.10, He says, so then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. So he broadens the instruction to everyone. We we should live a life of generosity toward those who have needs all around us. He prioritizes that list by saying that our fellow believers, the members of our Christian family, should be first in line for our consideration, for our help. But I think that that doesn't just mean that we give willy-nilly to anybody that says they want something from us. There is wise generosity. Unwise generosity becomes enabling behavior that actually can make the problem worse. Paul talked about that as well when he wrote to the church at Thessalonica. In his second letter, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, he said, We command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who's walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you receive from us. You yourselves know how you ought to imitate us, because we were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it, but with toil and labor we worked night and day. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. We hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. As for you, brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. Interestingly, it's the same phrase he uses in Galatians chapter 6. Do not grow weary in doing good. If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person, have nothing to do with him, that he may be ashamed. Do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. So Paul, in saying be generous to all, he wasn't saying enable lazy people, right? A person should show that they are willing to do what they can to care for themselves, but when you see someone who is, is willing to work, but they're in a tough spot, they need help, I think Paul would say, be generous. 
You've been made a steward of God's resources. How would God want to help or bless that brother or sister that is in need? Generosity toward all. The biggest principle that I think we get out of this is this principle of sowing and reaping. Galatians 6, 7, do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever one sows, that he will also reap. The immediate context, he's talking about how we use money. But he's talking about more than money. This principle extends to all kinds of things. If you look at verse 8, he says, The one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. The one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. See, he's kind of moving beyond just the money thing here. He's talking about this flesh and spirit and, and where you're sowing, how you're sowing, what are the priorities in life. And, and what does he mean when he says that God is not mocked? Well, that word mocked literally means to turn your nose up at something. And Paul reminds us that there is a way that God's world works. It's just the way it works. And you can mock it. You can laugh at it, you can deny it, you can imagine that you're more clever than that, that your situation is unique, the exception that goes beyond everybody else's, but it doesn't change the reality of how God's world operates. He says, don't be deceived. What God has said is true. God is not mocked. When our kids were little, now they're all grown and married, when they were little, there were times that we would see them making a bad decision. And we would decide not to say anything. The reason being, we would say to each other, you don't have to enforce gravity. Gravity does what gravity does. You can deny gravity, you can laugh at gravity, you can tell me that you've got a theory that will let you overcome gravity, but the fact is, gravity just works. Gravity will not be mocked. And so sometimes we'd see a child making a bad decision, and we just knew that they were about to transgress an immutable law of the universe, and we didn't have to say anything. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. And he says, you will reap exactly what you sow. sow." When I planted crookneck squash, there was absolutely no question what I was going to be eating come harvest time. Crookneck squash. You will reap what you, show, what you sow. There's another rule that comes into play when you talk about planting and harvesting. He says, let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. I want you to look at those phrases, let us not grow weary, do not give up. See, if you want to keep farming, you have to keep planting. Don't get weary. Don't give up. Keep doing the thing you should be doing. I spent a lot of years doing sales. When I started my business, there were days, weeks, months of going out, cold calling, making phone calls, going into offices, trying to get an appointment with the manager, and, and there were countless times of being told, we're too busy, or come back another time, or no thank you, we don't accept solicitations, or on and on it went, all the ways you get told no. The other thing I found was I was showing up just after they had bought the thing that I was selling. Boy, it's too bad we just finished building a new clinic. It's too bad you weren't here three months ago. Oh, we just bought that last week. You go through a lot of that stuff. But in sales, there's what you call filling the pipeline. And and you know how it is when you first turn on a garden hose, you turn the faucet on and nothing's coming out the other end, but you know the water's moving through the line? And you've got to keep water coming in this end if you want to see it coming out that end. And so in sales, you do that. You you keep filling the pipeline. You keep knocking on doors. You keep making the calls. And and the day comes that people start calling you. And they say, we're about to do a project. We wonder if we could talk to you about it. We need to purchase something next week. Could you stop by? And and all of a sudden, the phone starts ringing, almost like magic. It's almost like it's ringing all by itself. Except you know it's not ringing all by itself. You know there's been a lot of planting that's gone on ahead of time that's brought this about. That takes time, and it means we don't get weary, we don't give up. 
And Paul says that is true spiritually as well, that, that we keep on investing in the things we know we need to invest in, even when we may not see the immediate payoff to it. And even when we start to see the payoff, we begin to see the fruit that's coming out of it, we don't stop investing. Any salesman will tell you that if you have filled the pipeline, the sales are starting to come, and then you just quit doing sales, the sales will dry up. You keep investing. Talk to those who have labored for years sharing Jesus in Muslim-majority countries. People who spent maybe entire careers wondering if, if what they were investing in was ever going to see fruit. But now you go into so many of those countries and there are tremendous revivals breaking out. There's all kinds of spiritual fruit because there have been people who have been investing and God's Spirit is at work and the fruit is coming. He says, don't get weary, don't give up, because in due season. See, seeds are slow to grow. It's one reason I'm not a real good gardener. I, I like more instant gratification. Uh, nothing in my world, nothing in your world really encourages us to go slow, to plant and wait. I mean, when I was a kid, if you wanted to order something, that wasn't in a local store, you had to go to the Sears catalog or the J.C. Penney catalog, and you had to either phone in or mail in your order, which would take several days to get there, and then you would wait days, weeks, for something to come back. But then we got Amazon. In fact, we got Amazon Prime, and Prime guaranteed that they'd have it shipped to me within three to five days. Then they promised they'd ship it to me within two days. Now some stuff will come to me the next day at no additional charge. And I hear that in some places they're doing same-day delivery from Amazon. And in fact, they're trying to do delivery with drones, so it just comes out of the sky as soon as I call. That's the world I live in. My world expects it to come right now, real fast. And yet Paul reminds us that reaping spiritually doesn't necessarily mean instantaneous payout. Don't grow weary. Don't get tired. The harvest will come in due time. He says, in due time, we will reap. You will reap what you sow, and you will reap more than you sow. When I planted 10 crookneck squash seeds, my hope was not to get back 10 crookneck squash seeds. I planned to plant the seeds and to get back a bunch of squash that all had a bunch of their own seeds. I expected to get back far more than what I had invested. When it comes to the flesh, that's true too. When I sow to me, when I sow to my goals, there is something I reap from that as well. And sometimes it's a lot more than I wanted to reap. I didn't know that I was helping to plant and propagate algae in that pond when I was trying to solve the problem. But in fact, I was. And I quickly realized I was going to reap everything that I was sowing and a whole lot more. In fact, sometimes we discover that the packaging on the envelope was not accurate. What it promised us the seeds were going to give isn't what it actually delivered. How many of you remember this guy? The Marlboro Man. If you smoke Marlboros, guys, this is who you will be. One cool dude. When I was in the Philippines, <clears throat> I uh, walked by a place that was selling uh, a bunch of different tobacco products, and uh, a picture kind of caught my eye, and at first I thought it was some kind of a, a, a joke piece, except it was a pretty ugly joke, pretty bad taste. And, and the more I looked, the more I realized, no, this was true of all of the products in there. Uh, here's what you see when you go to buy Marlboros in the Philippines. Huh, that looks different than the Marlboro Man. Because what they're trying to tell you is that the seeds in that package don't produce what that image is telling you they produce. If you sow, you will 
reap. That's true in all sorts of areas in our life. We sow and we will reap. Hosea chapter 8 verse 7 says that they sow the wind and they shall reap the whirlwind. There's one more thing I want to say about this idea of sowing and reaping. And that is you are always sowing. Whether you think about it or not, you are always sowing. Life is a gift. We are stewards. Your your energies every day, you make choices to invest them one place or another. We are always sowing. Every choice about how we spend it, our time, our money, our talent, is a seed that we plant. And so the question is, when I look at where my life is invested, does it look like the way Jesus would want to steward his resources? Because if my life is his gift, then it's a fair question to say, am I investing his gift the way he'd want it invested? We're about to celebrate a new year, new opportunities to invest. There is an old adage. It says, if you sow a thought, you reap an act. If you sow an act, you reap a habit. If you sow a habit, you reap a character. And you sow a character and you reap a destiny. So my question is, in 2020, what new seeds are you going to plant? Where will you invest? Where is God calling you to be generous? And if you plant the crop you're planting, what are you going to reap? Or maybe a related question is, are there some seeds that you need to dig up? Is is there something you've got started in the garden plot and, and the Lord's saying, you aren't going to want that crop when it comes in. You know, this stuff all mattered to Paul. Verse 11, he says, uh, See with what large letters I'm writing to you with my own hand. As he finishes off this letter, he just, he just wants to communicate to these folks, this is important stuff. I, I, am, I am writing it in bold letters, underlined red ink. You know, as we've listened in on this conversation with the Galatians, we have learned that it is important to live a life that's not worried about looking religious, but one lived actually walking with, following after Jesus. Galatians 5, 6, In Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision is anything, but only faith expressing itself through love. We've also been reminded that that living under the guidance of the Holy Spirit is a day-by-day thing that we do. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Paul talked to them about what to do when a brother or a sister has fallen, gotten caught up in a sin, that we should treat such a person with gentleness. And he says, keep a watch on yourself that you don't get tempted as well. And then today we've looked at the fact, his counsel, that we should not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. I think that Paul's sign-off to the letter is a great way to sign off for all of us that have been eavesdropping on this conversation. He says, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. Amen.